And uh, his disciples asked him, saying, For well, why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and get this and restore all things. The book of Revelation contains a prophetic history of the true Church of God covering a span of 2,000 years. Now Jesus foresaw the future of the Church in uh, seven successive eras of time, seven spaces of time, one following the other from 31 AD when the Church was founded up until the second coming of Christ which is just a few years ahead of us right now at this time. And that is in the second and the third chapters of Revelation. This prophetic view is associated with seven churches of God once located on a mail route in Asia Minor during the first century AD. These churches were located in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Christ used characteristics from each church to define the spiritual condition of each corresponding era. Today, Christ's words concerning eras 1 through 6 have already been fulfilled. This fascinating and important history should be thoroughly understood by each member of God's church. Soon after Christ founded God's church, it had to contend with those who wanted to compromise God's truth and replace it with false doctrine. Paul warned the brethren of Galatia about these threats. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Who were these individuals perverting Christ's gospel? The Apostle Peter provides us with the answer. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. Christ prophesied the devastating impact perverting his gospel would have on God's church. To Ephesus he said, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. To Smyrna, Christ exhorted, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. To Pergamos he warned about holding fast to false doctrine. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. To Thyatira, Christ shows how rampant false doctrine would become among God's people. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Compromise persecution and acceptance of false doctrine through the centuries eventually led to God's church becoming spiritually dead. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And that is exactly the spiritual condition Herbert W. Armstrong found when he came in contact with God's church during the latter half of the 1920s. He describes what he found in the first volume of his autobiography. The only church I had so far found which kept the commandments of God in the testimony of Jesus Christ and at the same time bore the name of the original true church was this almost unknown little church of God with its small publishing house in Stanbury, Missouri. Yes, and yet, small, powerless, resultless, impotent though it appeared to be, here was a church with the right name keeping the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, and closer in its doctrines and teachings to what God had been opening my eyes to see plainly in His Word than any other church of which I knew. Small and impotent though it appeared, 
It had more Bible truth than any other church I could find. Could such a church, imperfect, fruitless, feeble, lacking in any sizable accomplishment, be the true church of God? Could this be Christ's instrument through whom he worked in carrying on God's work on earth? Jesus said, By their fruits you shall know them. Its fruits were not evil. It simply did not seem to produce fruit. Before God's church could move forward and produce fruit again, it would need to be resurrected. This spiritual resurrection would take place in the next era called Philadelphia. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. How would God resurrect his church back to spiritual life? The answer to this question can be found in the book of Malachi. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Christ explained the meaning of this prophecy when questioned about it by his disciples. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. This individual would not be Elijah the prophet resurrected, but one who would use the same power and spirit Elijah used as a prophet of God. What would be restored, and where would this restoration take place? It would be the true gospel of Jesus Christ restored back into God's church. Who then would God use to fulfill this prophecy? God used a man named Herbert W. Armstrong to spiritually resurrect his church by restoring all things back to it. Mr. Armstrong explained how this restoration occurred one doctrine at a time. As this study of the Bible continued, I was forced to come out of the fog of religious Babylon a single doctrine at a time. It was years later before I came to see the whole picture, to understand God's purpose being worked out here below, and why and how he is working it out. Like a jigsaw puzzle, the many single doctrinal parts ultimately fit together, and then, for the first time, the whole picture bursts joyfully into view. God's work through Mr. Armstrong is reflected in Christ's prophecy concerning the era of Philadelphia. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Through Mr. Armstrong, God infused new life back into his church by restoring God's truth, truth which had been lost through many centuries of compromise and attack. This restoration also allowed Mr. Armstrong to go through the open door of taking the gospel to the world as a witness, thus fulfilling Christ's prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. On December 17, 1983, in a sermon titled, Mission of the Philadelphia Church Era, Mr. Armstrong listed 18 truths God restored back into his church. These truths are, who and what is God? What and why is man? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit in man. The purpose of God. The first fruits. The true gospel. The government of God. The holy days. Begotten now. Born again the millennium, the identity of Israel, understanding prophecy, second and third tithe, Satan the devil, the identity of mystery Babylon, and called to be separate. It is the knowledge of these restored truths that Christ told Philadelphians to hold fast to. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Mr. Armstrong clearly understood what era he was living in. Unfortunately, most in the ministry today conduct themselves like they are still living in the Philadelphia era. This is the golden anniversary year of the church. This era of the church, and I emphasize this era because the church began in 31 AD and it's the same church. But it has had different eras, and there are certain distinctions and differences between different periods of time, as Jesus made plain in the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation.
God selected Mr. Armstrong to restore all things back into his church, which he made clear to a Congress of leading ministers on February 25, 1981. I have been asked, are you the Elijah? And I say no. I'm going to say something to you now that I would not have said five or six years ago under any circumstances. I don't go out trying to fulfill prophecy. But Jesus said, by their fruits you know. And sometimes you look back on fruits and you can tell some things you couldn't tell in advance before the fruits had been performed. What I have told you today is something, as I said, I would not have said a few years ago. But I look back and I look at the fruits and I see what the prophecy says and I see that the prophecy has been fulfilled. I wonder if you brethren see it. Remember, Mr. Armstrong was speaking to the leading ministers of God's church in 1981. Having restored all things, Mr. Armstrong was very specific that no one would continue the work God called him to do. I think that when God lets me die, the thing he's called me for will have been completed, preparing the way for the second coming of Christ, carrying that gospel of the kingdom to the world for a witness to all nations. If I have been someone in the power and spirit of Elijah, Remember, there is no prophecy that God will have an Elisha following Elijah. There is no one in the church that has the qualifications, the experience that could carry on the work that God has given me to do. An honest examination by those willing to do it will clearly see God use Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong to restore all things back into his church and to take the gospel of the kingdom of God to the world as a witness. Has God sent someone to restore knowledge to this church, brethren? I'm not tooting any horns. I'm just telling you what has actually happened. And you know it's happened. Are you one who continues to deny God's work through Herbert W. Armstrong? Christ prophesied 2,000 years ago the final era of God's church would fail to remember the past. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. If God allowed Laodiceans to continue in their lukewarm condition, these restored truths would once again be corrupted and lost. But before that happens, Laodiceans will be corrected for being lukewarm in great tribulation. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Do Christ's words for Laodiceans apply to you? Before you answer, consider this. Laodiceans do not know they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Mr. Armstrong's concerns about spiritual carelessness were absolutely valid. I'm afraid a lot of you don't listen. Well, I hope there's not a lot of you either. Maybe it's only a few. But I know that some are bound to be a little bit careless. Remember that faith is simply believing that God will not lie and that what God has promised, he will perform. So. Let's be thankful. Let's praise God for it. Let's give all thanks to God Almighty the Father. It is hard to admit being a Laodicean, yet Laodiceans must admit this and repent to enter God's kingdom. You can choose to admit it now, repent, and be protected during Great Tribulation, or you can admit it later in the midst of Great Tribulation. Remember, we all have the responsibility to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Laodicea, stop being careless. Time is running out. Before great tribulation begins, examine your spiritual life so you can become zealous again and repent.